The story of Zacchaeus and the Gospel today is a very beautiful story of a sinner turning away from his sins. And this incident only appears in the Gospel of St. Luke. People have noticed that St. Luke, more than the other evangelists, tries very hard to show us the great love of our Lord for sinners. And this is a perfect example of that. We hear in the Gospel that Zacchaeus was a chief publican, so he was a tax collector. He had a Jewish name, but some of the fathers of the church think he was more likely a Gentile because the Jews were not normally tax collectors although he may have been a Gentile who converted to the Jewish religion. But it says that he was rich, and in those days, tax collectors were very unpopular people. First of all, obviously, because they made people pay their taxes. But also because they were very often corrupt and dishonest, and they charged people more tax than they were required to pay. And they kept the extra amount for themselves. And it seems clear that this is how Zacchaeus became a rich man, basically through extortion. If you read the Gospels, you see that publicans are often mentioned as the archetype of the most wicked person there is, which is generally how the Jews thought about them. But what sort of man was Zacchaeus? Most likely, he was someone whose life revolved around his business, including his crime and dishonesty. He probably thought of very little else besides getting as much money as he could by whatever means necessary. And he probably thought very little about God or religion. But he seems to have had some good natural qualities that we see in the story that allowed him to be open to receive the truth. Although he was a rich man, he was obviously not proud. He seems to have cared very little for his personal dignity and just did what he thought he should do without caring very much what other people might think about him. He had a sincerity and a simplicity about him that made him immune to human respect. And this is a good thing. Zacchaeus had certainly heard about our Lord as a prophet and a miracle worker, and possibly even as the Savior of the Jews. He must have known also about the accusations of the Pharisees against our Lord, too. In his line of work, he came in contact with numerous people, especially rich people and, and businessmen who had to pay a lot of taxes, and he would have been pretty familiar with the local news. So he had developed a great curiosity and desire to see our Lord. So one day he is in his office, sitting in front of his, his ledger book, trying to figure out who he can maybe squeeze a little bit more money out of, and at the same time trying to make sure that none of his employees had taken a single penny from him. And he hears a noise outside and finds out that it is our Lord, finally come to his town. He immediately closes his shop and goes outside into the street in order to see this great man, to get his own impression of him. But there is a huge crowd around our Lord, which is very likely always uh, around our Lord, and he can't see him at all. So he comes up with a plan and he runs down the street, to where it looks like our Lord is going to go by. And he climbs up into a tree so that he can see above everyone else. And this is a very strange image in our minds. This man is very rich, and as a tax collector, has a certain form of authority over the population. And at the very least, he has to have a, at least a somewhat intimidating personal presence about him in order to be able to do his job. And yet here he is in his fancy, expensive clothing, climbing into a tree like a child, making himself look foolish. Most likely people were staring at him and even laughing at him. But he doesn't care about that at all. He wants to see our Lord, and if people laugh at what he's doing, he, he doesn't care. 
here we see a very important difference between Zacchaeus and the Pharisees. If we try to imagine one of the Pharisees climbing into a tree to see our Lord, we, we can't. They would never have done such a thing. Their pride would never let them do something like this. And this is one of the important lessons of the story. That our Lord approaches people who have humility and who don't suffer from human respect. Our Lord gets to the tree where Zacchaeus is and and tells him to come down. And we can imagine the crowd standing around and wondering what's going to happen now. They are expecting our Lord to denounce this evil tax collector for taking their money from them. But they are amazed and horrified when they hear our Lord say, This day I must abide in thy house. And our Lord wanted to eat lunch that day at the house of Zacchaeus because he saw Zacchaeus' eagerness to see him. And he saw his humility and his interest in our Lord and his openness to the truth. Our Lord came to save sinners. And he saw that this wicked sinner could be called to repentance. And just like Zacchaeus, our Lord also didn't care anything what people thought about him. If people thought he was doing something wrong. So when the people heard that our Lord was going to this wicked man's house, they were shocked and disgusted and they condemned our Lord in their minds and this is another important lesson that if we want to follow our Lord we have to put aside our own judgments and our own beliefs and we have to accept everything that that our Lord does and everything that he tells us without any reserve we can't think that we know more than our Lord about anything But this is a problem that a lot of people have with our Lord's Catholic Church. A lot of people want to follow the church, just like the people in the crowd were following our Lord that day. Because most of what he said sounded good. And people are interested in the Catholic Church because they are attracted by its holiness. Or maybe they are Catholics already sometimes, and then something comes up where they come across a commandment or a doctrine or some principle that doesn't make sense to them or that is difficult to our weak human minds. And they say, no, I I can't believe that or I can't do that because that can't be right. And they lose their faith. People say, for example, how can God allow us to suffer? How can there be something like original sin? How can we inherit a sin from our first parents that we didn't commit ourselves, but which makes our whole lives a life of suffering. Our people want to work on Sunday without a justifying reason. Or they don't want to be faithful to their spouse no matter what. Or they don't want to observe the laws of marriage. Or they want to have their body cremated when they die like anyone else, everyone else. How many people have followed our Lord for many years until they get to an obstacle like that, where they have to submit their intellect to that of the church, and they refuse to do so, and and instead of accepting what the church tells them, they say, I really don't think God would tell me to do this, so I think that his church is wrong, and they fall away. But if our Lord is God, everything he tells us is absolute truth. Even if we don't understand it or have trouble believing it, believing that God would tell us that, we always have to remember that God's ways are not our ways. This story also shows us the power of God's grace. Literally only a few minutes before this event, this man was doing what he had spent his whole life doing. He was sitting in his office, counting the money he had stolen, and trying to figure out how to steal even more. And he went out to see our Lord out of simple curiosity, and in the course of just a few minutes, his whole life was changed. This tells us that we should never doubt the power of God's grace to convert others. We should pray for sinners and unbelievers with confidence. 
and with the knowledge that God can change people's hearts. So our Lord and his apostles go to this man's house, and they, they sit down and eat with him. And as he is sitting there, listening to the holiness and wisdom of our Lord, he is completely converted, and he decides to repent and make restitution. But just like before, he doesn't want to do this secretly or in a hidden manner to avoid people seeing it or avoid people talking about him. No, he does it in front of everyone in the house. He tells our Lord that he promises to make restitution for everything that he stole. In fact, he said he would give half his goods to the poor and give back four times what he stole to everyone that he defrauded. How this man's whole life has been changed in such a short amount of time. And he is an excellent example of how we are required to make restitution for ill-gotten goods. We have to give them back immediately. We can't say, well, I'll, I'll give it all back eventually, someday before I die eventually. We can't say, well, I'll have to sit down and figure out how much I can afford to give back. And, of course, I don't want to become too poor by giving back what, what I stole. But we have an obligation. We can't make any excuses. No, Zacchaeus promises to give it all back. In fact, when he says that he'll give back four times what he stole, this is actually what is commanded in the Law of Moses. In the Law of Moses, a thief was commanded to make fourfold restitution for what he stole. Wouldn't that be nice if we had that today? It's certainly better than, than what we have today. The thieves are, are rarely forced to give back anything at all. That shows you the difference between a, a law written by God himself and a law written by, by liberals and, and people with no religion. But someone might be wondering about the math involved here. Zacchaeus says he's going to give half his money to the poor and then he is going to make restitution to all the people that he stole from by paying them four times what he stole. How is that possible if most of what he had was ill-gotten to begin with? The answer is most likely that he didn't know all of the people he had defrauded. He had stolen from so many people that he couldn't track all of them down. So what he did was to apply the general rule of making restitution, which the church teaches, which is that if we have stolen something and we are not able to give it back to the person that we stole from, either because we don't know who that person is or we can't find them anymore, or whatever other reason, we are not just let off the hook and allowed to keep our ill-gotten goods. No, in that case, we have to get rid of what we have stolen, and since we can't give it to, to the victim of the crime, we have to give it to the poor, or to some holy purpose, or, or to the church, or give it to charity. So that is what Zacchaeus is doing here. He is giving to the poor the money that he is not able to restore to its rightful owners. And the people that he is able to make restitution to, he gives them four times what he, take, he took. And in that scenario, the math involved is possible, though just barely. Most likely this left him very poor, but rich in the grace of God. And our Lord promised or praised Zacchaeus for this. He said, this day is salvation come to this house. This man has been forgiven of his sins and is now in sanctifying grace. And that is the beautiful ending of this very beautiful story. Now, it's an interesting question why the church reads the gospel of the story of Zacchaeus on the feast of the dedication of a church. And the answer is that there are a lot of similarities between a church and the house of Zacchaeus in this story. First of all, our Lord and his apostles came to the house of Zacchaeus. And in the church, we have our Lord present in the Blessed Sacrament, and his ministers are present also in the form of the clergy. In the house of Zacchaeus, there is, of course, 
Zacchaeus and his friends, good people and bad people. And in the church we have the same thing. Our Lord also preached the gospel in the house of Zacchaeus, and that happens also in church. And in the house of Zacchaeus, he himself was converted and brought to repentance, and most likely other people who were there at the same time, which is exactly what happens also in church. And Zacchaeus was forgiven of his sins. And again, this happens, happens here. And in the house of Zacchaeus, they had a meal for our Lord, a great banquet. And in church, we have the banquet of the Holy Eucharist. Let us think today about all these lessons. Imagine if we had been on the streets of Jericho on this afternoon, how we would have gone to the house of Zacchaeus and hopefully been privileged to see these beautiful events. We would have listened attentively and with devotion to our Lord's words on this occasion, and we would have asked him to forgive our sins too, and been edified at the repentance of Zacchaeus. Well, this church here is another house of Zacchaeus in a sense. Our Lord is here too, just as much as he was there. And we should come here with those exact same sentiments of love and devotion and contrition for our sins. If we do that too, we will hear the same thing that Zacchaeus heard from our Lord. This day is salvation come to this house. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.